make sure I'm actually good to go. Welcome. Uh, thanks so much for coming on this morning. Uh, I know it's a very jam-packed uh, event, a lot of talks, uh, a lot of networking, the occasional party to attend. Uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of join us here today. Now, before we kick off, I want to make sure that you're all logged into the live chat. Uh, we have some of our team online who will be there and able to answer your questions. For a few of them, it is 4 a.m. in the morning, so be kind uh, with your questions. Uh, and I suppose I'd love to say that you know, we're experts in this space. Uh, we're certainly learning on the go. Uh, and you know, quite often, we have things kind of change uh, under our feet. And we're kind of back to the drawing board. So as much as we're looking forward to sharing what we've built here at Lawview today, we're equally keen to hear from yourselves. Uh, and so please connect on the chat. And please connect with us on uh, LinkedIn as well. It'd be cool to keep in touch. So actually, before I go into that, so, so our talk today is on embedding uh, intelligence into workflows for our customers. So what we've really been working on here at Lawview uh, is to evolve from just that open chat style interface that a lot of you become familiar with when it comes to utilizing AI products, uh, and really kind of look at how we embed uh, AI into our UI and UX. So I'm Sam, and we're going to be joined on stage by Zuhil, uh, my colleague, who is a lot more qualified and a lot better at speaking to this than I am. So I'll just bring you through a, a little bit of a kind of intro as to what we've built here at Lawview. And he is uh, Suhil Zell, uh, Workspace Intelligence Product Manager. Uh, he has a long career in working in machine learning and search for a number of companies before joining us here at Lawview and kind of really accelerating our uh, AI capabilities inside the company. So before he takes over and really gets into the weeds with what we've built here, uh, I'm going to share with you all kind of where we started our AI journey uh, here at Lawview. What we've really tried, I suppose, to improve and, and look at ways that we improve the experience for our customers. So Hill's going to take you through what's happening under the hood uh, and then also share examples of probably where AI was not the right technology for the job. So yes, we did kind of fall into that trap uh, a number of times probably overcomplicating our solution by trying to shoehorn AI in uh, to a product when it really wasn't needed uh, because we thought it would be cool. Uh, it turns out that that's not always kind of the, the right approach. Uh, so I'm sure you'll all agree it's an incredibly exciting time uh, to be involved in the software space. It's probably equally quite painful. Uh, I'd imagine like a lot of you out there, when ChatGDP started to appear on the scenes, uh, there was a great excitement in your companies around how you could start kind of utilizing it. And all the demos started to appear. And especially for our space being the legal space, it was like magic, uh, how we kind of like spit out these descriptions and reams of text. Uh, and then the question started to appear for us on almost every sales call that we attended. You know, Do you have AI? Is there AI? What type of AI is there? Uh, and then when we answered all those questions and got through the RFPs and RFIs and all the, the fun, kind of fun stuff, we're always met with, well, we haven't updated our policies yet, and we can't use AI. Uh, so, so much fun, uh, like I said, an exciting place to be. So for a little bit of context around what we do here at Lawview, uh, we are a SaaS product. Uh, our product is a legal workspace. Uh, and it's a legal workspace for corporate legal teams. So we deal with just the legal teams inside large corporations, not law firms. So we help these teams to effectively manage their workflows. Uh, so such as streamlining how the wider business engages with them, uh, through to how they send legal requests through, as well as acting kind of like a DMS storage, so storing all the contracts, all the files, all the documents, and then how they store and, and, and interact with external law firms as well. So you can kind of think of law view like, I suppose, Salesforce, but for corporate legal teams. So in short, we also store some of the most sensitive data inside any organization, uh, which you can imagine is a huge amount of fun when you're trying to roll AI uh, out in these organizations as well. So how do we enable AI functionality for a risk adverse group of people and really look at how we enhance their capabilities and productivities for the legal work that they do? So legal is a space where accuracy and completeness and consistency is key. 
Uh, 90% is not really kind of good enough for our users and a lot of use cases. Now this will be the same for a lot of you that work in highly regulated organizations, uh, such as you know, health, finance, government. Uh, you can imagine it's not super useful if you're just giving 90% of someone's medical history uh, or 80% you know, of someone's uh, numbers when you're a publicly limited company. So it, it's really been key for us, and it's been a key challenge is like how do we get accuracy and completeness uh, to bring our customers on that kind of AI journey. So with that in mind, I suppose we've had to make kind of tough calls about what features do we roll out, uh, what features do we kill, uh, and then where do we kind of double down. Uh, it's also really challenged us to think about the way we build products like AI into our interface and our kind of UX and UI. So I thought I would kick off uh, kind of where we started our AI journey uh, with a demo, and it's a feature that we called AI Assist. I was not brave enough to do a live demo, so I have set this in as a video uh, for you to go through. Uh, but you'll see here on screen that when I push, so this is a, the UX for a contract. We have a law view AI assistant or agent that we uh, called Laura uh, at one stage. And you see here we've just asked for a summary of the contract, and it's kind of just spat out a block of text. And it's, you know, the, the LMN's done its best to summarize the contract uh, for our users, but it doesn't really pull out all the key information that our users would be looking for. It's done a good job of summarizing it. Uh, it's done a good job of providing risks, but it's also a block of text. Uh, it's not easy to digest. And the most important thing from this is not very consistent across different contracts. So as we ran this at just different contracts, it kind of gave different weighting to different key parts inside a contract around summaries. Uh, so we took that on board and really looked at like how do we improve this? Like our users, we, we know where they are. We know what they're trying to achieve. We have a lot of learnings inside that space. You know, we are dealing with in-house lawyers. We know kind of what documents are gonna be uploading. So it's like, how do we take that prompt engineering a little bit further? So here we're on the LawView Hub. Uh, I'll just call out the little planner in the middle there because Sahil will speak to that later uh, as well. But in this hub, I'm just going to go over, click into a contract. Now we've done a little bit more work now around what the, the engineering behind the scenes is gonna be. So I've loaded into a contract here. So in the middle, you'll see that there is a contract I slowly scrolled through this in the video. Uh, I thought this would be faster when I was actually demoing it to myself. It's amazing when you're on stage talking that it seems like a very long scroll. Uh, but it's an 11-page document, and, and you can imagine as a lawyer going through that and then trying to quickly summarize that, uh, what's it going to look like. So you'll see now we've moved up into workspace intelligence. So we've moved away from just the chat-enabled uh, UX just in that, and we're prompting people with summarizers contracts. We know what they're going to be doing in context, uh, and at the bottom it knew that they were in the contract as well. So that quickly spins through, and everything that now is happening behind the scenes is going to give a more complete summary because we know the things that our lawyers are looking for. They're looking for things like parties and key dates and terms and key clauses. We generate that in a consistent sort of look. So if I now roll in another one conveniently, got that timing slightly wrong. Uh, but you see this is another uh, summary from another contract, and now it's a, it's a much more consistent kind of look and feel, uh, and that's been a, a much better experience for our users at all. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Sahil, who's going to now walk us through how we kind of built AI Assist from the ground up, and just the, the infrastructure and the workings that's gone on kind of behind the scenes. Sahil. All right. Um... So how did we build the AISS uh, platform and what did the architecture for that look like? Um, so this was actually done in March 2023, kind of really close to when ChatGPT first came around, uh, around November. A few of our engineers, and actually it was part of a hackathon project, so we do these annually. A um, few of our engineers got together and, and said, hey, can we cobble a few services together on Azure and build a quick proof of concept? Um, it wasn't really perfect, as it says on the slide. It was slow. Uh, we were doing things kind of in a bad, poor way. Uh, it was clunky. And, but when we demoed what we had at that time to our users, uh, and they really loved it, because uh, it was at that time the best, 
that um, uh, it was a big step forward for LawView. However, our biggest challenge was um, it wasn't really scalable. We chunked up contract documents, and some of those documents could be hundreds of pages long. So the one that Sam demoed was only 10, but often they're quite longer than that. And what we were really doing badly was taking that document, chunking it, when the customer was requesting summarization or Q&A, we would take each chunk, ask the same question, and then do that 100 times if we had 100 chunks for a document, and then summarize the responses from each of those chunks. So it was really bad uh, at that time, but it was kind of really uh, good enough for, it, uh, for the time. So we knew we needed to do something different um, because customer expectations were changing and um, there was more demand for what we could do with AI. So what do we move to next? Uh, this is kind of our current architecture. Uh, and we started building the, the next workspace intelligence feature around March 2024. We went back to the, you know, uh, we went back and sort of thought about what is it that we need uh, in terms of scale, flexibility, um, and leverage some of the new Azure services that are available, as well as new models. So in this diagram, we're uh, using Azure Service Bus to queue on-demand changes when documents are uploaded rather than waiting for users to request AI features. That means we can process those content upfront uh, and do it within minutes, if not faster. We're also using Azure Databricks uh, as part of our content uh, processing block, which forms the backbone for our data ingestion and processing, because Databricks also gives us access to a whole set of native Python uh, Python workflows, which are really good for data engineering and data science. We're also using uh, document intelligence from Azure and embedding models to create embeddings and store them in vectors, uh, which are really useful for search, which we didn't have in the previous version as well. Um, and as you can see, we're also using AI search to store those. Uh, we're, we're combining AI search with SQL Server production servers as well. So some data goes straight into production SQL Server alongside with uh, it's the same server that we use to run the production app. And so that was um, how we process data. And then the rest of the diagram is how we uh, take that data and answer user questions and, and prompts. So on the user side, when they ask a question in the Workspace Intelligence chat panel, um, they're first talking to Semantic Kernel. And we were really early in adapting, uh, adopting Semantic Kernel. At that point, I think it was like a open source package for research and development, but now I think it's migrated up to um, uh, production, ready, uh, production ready package. One of the biggest advantages that we had with Semantic Kernel is that it's a, it was available in dot, um, .NET natively, which is a really beneficial thing for our software engineers, because most of them are .NET engineers. That means they didn't really have to think about learning Langchain or any of the other tools that do something similar. So it really integrated nicely into uh, existing skill sets that we had in the company. As well as being .NET native, it meant that it could also leverage our existing security and governance models that we already had in the app. And trying to do that by mixing Python with Langchain would have been really complicated. Um, the rest of the diagram kind of shows how we process through Semantic Kernel. So we take uh, the user prompt, we embed it, using the same embedding model, so we have a vectorized version of the user query, which we can do some vector search or hybrid search to match user query to the original documents embedding. Um, and we're also currently tweaking what we do with the user prompts. So we take that prompt and also send it to LLMs, in this case, um, OpenAI, uh, Azure OpenAI, to expand that user prompt. So not just answering the question exactly as they give us, but can we expand that a little bit further um, so that we can provide much more richer information. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that the kernel is obviously leveraging a whole bunch of custom plugins that we've made that answer specific business use cases or access data from SQL Server or AI Search. And um, we then take all of that data from SQL as well as um, AI Search, combine that together with the user prompt and send it to OpenAI to generate a response. That finally comes back to the kernel. We sense check it, make sure we're not saying anything we shouldn't, um, and before sending it to the chat panel. Turns out this architecture that we've got is fairly standard 
um, and it closely matches some of the suggested practices from Azure and a bunch of other places. I'll hand over to Moazma from Microsoft to say a few words about how this applies to other legal tech and other industries. Thank you, Soho. Uh, so I am Moazma, I lead the SQL DB team and I lead the AI strategy for SQL database and uh, thanks for sharing this architecture. What uh, Soil just shared is pretty standard, what we are seeing across our customers, the standard rack pattern, uh, re retrieval augmented generation. If any of you don't know about it, definitely read up. Uh, we are, they're using basically the data from their workspaces, uh, stored in SQL, going to AI search, and a combination of that uh, to open AI, and then basically getting the exact or detailed response uh, from the model to answer the questions or prompts that their users have. Uh, there is a lot of data security built in, so the boundary that you have in Azure, it actually applies to this architecture as well, and it's pretty standard, um, and, and it's been a great partnership to see how you're using this. Awesome, thank you. Um, uh, you'll come, by, come back in a couple of minutes yeah. to talk about a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, the, the few other things that I wanna mention here is that um, in typical rag patterns that we've seen online, typically it's like, hey, we have a thousand documents, we chunk those up and then we're asking questions on those. But for us, uh, we have data that's moving all the time. So we've got hundreds of customers, they're creating thousands of documents. Some of them are creating tens of thousands of documents um, every month and we, we're processing those all the time. The documents come in various sort of shapes and sizes. Some of them are 10 pages, some of them are hundreds, hundreds of pages. They also come in various formats, uh, including, which I'll cover shortly in the next, file, uh, next slide. Um, and we use Semantic Kernel, which is obviously I touched on, which is really valuable, uh, that allows us to connect to different data sources, as well as new data sources. So Cosmos DB is another one that we're currently proof, uh, testing to see if it can become another different data source. And Semantic Kernel makes that easy to connect to anything that we have within our app. Um, and then the security and governance, again, is um, really important for us, as Sam mentioned. We're in a highly regulated environment, and the kernel makes that easy in terms of um, the security and governance model. So this is kind of an updated version of the previous diagram. We've got all of these sort of sample of different formats that we deal with. They go to blob storage. Some of them go into the content processing block, and we generate vectors, which is directly used by workspace intelligence. The same documents go through different and existing processes that power our global search uh, within LawView as well. And um, as I mentioned earlier, Kernel makes it easy to connect to whatever sources that we have within the LawView app. Um, the, the plugins that exist within the Semantic Kernel, they use the same business logic that's already been programmed within the LawView app. That means a, uh, a lot of our customers have super secret files or contract documents or emails that a very limited set of users have access to within their organization. And that all of that permission is already modeled within the LawView app. And the AI features uh, piggybacks basically on that governance model and make sure that search, uh, whether that's through filters that are applied to the search settings or the LawView database, SQL queries all go through that same governance model. And we never retrieve any chunks or documents or information that a specific user doesn't have access to. Um, so that means that no data for a user within an organization leaks out, uh, and an organization data never leaks to another organization, which is really important, because um, we know sometimes you, know, you can't always control what, um, what AI uh, accesses and um, returns to the user. Um, so where we're headed next, and uh, so what you saw on the previous slide is not a global deployment we're actually deployed in individual specific regions, including US, uh, AU, or Australia, and EU, and a couple of other smaller regions. And as Sam mentioned earlier, we operate in a pretty heavily regulated environment with uh, strict data sovereignty requirements. That means no data can leave a region. This creates one of the biggest challenges for us from an AI perspective, because some of the newer models aren't always available in the regional deployments that we're in. With, you know, for example, Azure OpenAI GPTs have historically updated quite frequently. In fact, there was an update yesterday by OpenAI with a new model for 4.0. Um, they often come with significant lift 
in reasoning and intelligence capabilities, as well as context window limits, um, and are actually cheaper. The newer models, for example, are about 92% cheaper per token compared to the legacy four, four, uh, four models. But like I said, the newer models aren't always available for us. Um, but to access them and to improve our customer experience and save money at the same time, we're moving to data zones, which is something that was launched recently. Uh, and we've actually already trialing uh, data zones in EU um, to give us access to those models. I'll, um, I'll call Moazma again on the stage to give us a little bit more about how data zones is helping a lot of the Azure, Azure customers as well. Yeah, so same uh, thing here. As I mentioned about the security and privacy, this is something top of mind for many of our customers. Many of you might be thinking about data sovereignty rules or uh, not leaving the data in the boundary, especially for your users. Uh, so thinking about each layer of that pattern is the key concept here. Thinking about where your data is stored, what models you call, and then how do you access that data from your uh, source is itself. So the whole thing needs to be fully secured within the boundary of how you define it. So you should be in control of, of this boundary, and that's the concept we have introduced in terms of data zones. Uh, it applies to your entire data estate and the entire application state. And if you have not tried that or not looked at it, definitely something to try out. And this is a great example of what they have implemented. And we want to see other customers really looking into this as well as their requirements are met through data zones as as well, so thanks. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and the last thing I wanna say about the uh, data zones is that I think the provisional uh, PTUs aren't currently available yet. I know Azure is working on releasing that as well. And we're likely to move to those as we scale up our users and the experience that we have with workspace intelligence. Um, and we understand, have a better understanding of the throughput requirements. So data zones are, are going to be really uh, valuable for us. Um, on to kind of key, uh, critical takeaway number two, uh, data is still critical. Um, uh, in the early days of AI with you know, GPT-3 and GPT-4, it felt like you could just kind of take all your data and throw it to AI and it would do some magic. And it felt like, you know, it kind of did magic. Um, it's like, you know, for example, for us, the AI assist felt like it was magical and, you know, you didn't have to do a lot of work. Uh, you could cobble something together and make it work. But you also saw with the workspace intelligence contract summarization that Sham showed, uh, you kind of also needed to do uh, slightly more and slightly, you know, slightly better experience, so provide a consistent and comprehensive summarization. That was made possible because we learned what data that we needed to process and how to process, as well as prompt engineer to generate that output. Um, and we, after making those changes, we saw that lift in quality. Let's take a look at another really uh, critical example uh, for our customers. One of the biggest challenges our customers face is managing the key dates and time periods that are often buried within contract documents. So imagine you have a 100 page document, there's probably about five to 10 really important dates in within those documents. These dates often drive critical decisions within the organizations and have serious commercial implications. For instance, should we renew this contract or not? And if we're not going to renew it, when is the last date that we can cancel before it automatically renews and costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars for software or services or other things that we probably don't need anymore? This is a real life example of customers that have been tied into hundreds of thousands of dollars of contract for three years. So missing this time window means significant commercial impact for, uh, for our customers. Now imagine also trying to stay on top of all of those obligations across hundreds, if not tens of thousands of contracts that some of our customers have. It's pretty overwhelming. So what's the first thing that you would do when faced with a problem like this? Obviously you think, I'll just throw it at AI. So we said, why don't we use our existing systems that we've already got for workspace intelligence, build a new plugin that retrieves all the right chunks from the document using AI search, and then we send it over to OpenAI, and hopefully it will generate all the dates for us. Uh, and surely they'll all be right, and they'll all be accurate, and we'll get all of them, right? Uh, turns out, obviously not. Um, as expected, we got about 67% you know, of the dates from the contracts uh, extracted using our existing systems. Some were missed because the chunks from AI search that we retrieve completely got, got it wrong. Uh, we had a retrieval error of some kind. 
We also missed some of the dates because um, the AI search, you have to have like a cutoff of how many chunks that you want to retrieve. You can't retrieve all of them uh, before sending them over to GPTs. So we missed some dates because the dates were in a later um, uh, chunks that were not included. This was obviously unacceptable. As Sam said earlier, 90% accuracy in our legal tech field is probably not good enough. Um, in this particular use case, we knew that there were commercial implications of missing a key date. And if our users didn't trust AI or couldn't rely on it, then that wasn't really valuable because it was an important part of their workflow. So remember this from a few slides ago. Uh, that arrow pointing to search is where we were doing all the heavy lifting to get those key dates, hoping that our AI search settings, the chunks we had, the search query filters from Semantic Kernel, the plugins, all of those things worked perfectly every time. Obviously from the chart, it was only working about 67% of the time. The remaining 33, it failed because one of the links in the chain didn't quite work as effectively as needed. So we needed to find alternatives and this wasn't going to cut it for our customers. And building trust and maintaining that is really important uh, because once you lose that trust in the AI feature, users aren't going to come back and, and use it. So for this use case, what we ended up doing was shifting left in the process. We started to um, enrich the data during ingestion using LLMs and natural language processing so we could extract the required dates um, and with far, far greater confidence, get them all and store them downstream for downstream retrieval. We also didn't just do standard dates like effective dates or expiry or termination dates. We got a little bit more creative and asked the LLM to infer dates from natural language. For instance, in a clause like, this agreement will auto renew if not canceled within 90 days of anniversary, there is no explicit date mentioned there. But when you prompt the LLM in the right way, you can actually extract the date um, that is inferred or can be derived from this. So um, the other thing that we were also able to do by doing this is uh, combining the LLM stuff with NLP uh, data processing techniques, like duplicate, date, duplicate dates. Because sometimes the same date is mentioned multiple times in the same contract. So this allowed us to rigorously stress test our approach as part of document processing as opposed to relying later on downstream. That means we could be pretty confident and that comprehensive. Uh, we were capturing all the dates, that we were capturing them and making sure they were correct, and we were reducing hallucinations, i.e. the system wasn't making updates that didn't exist. And that was a bit of a problem, but we worked through it. Um, all of that is, um, evaluated using our ground truth data, which I'll cover shortly. Um, so what did this mean? This approach led us to a major lift in accuracy um, and completely eliminated some of the retrieval errors that we were seeing. We also had some really amazing user experience uh, changes as well. We could, one of the key one was speed. Answers were returned immediately, rather than having the user wait for AI search to complete, for the LLM to generate the dates and then show them. Because we'd already processed them up front, we were just displaying something that was already stored. We could, be, we could provide comprehensive dates. We don't miss anything. We could also delight our users um, by showing them dates that they typically don't really extract from other systems or other processes because they're just hard to defer, uh, derive or infer. Overall, this shift helped us provide a delightful experience for our users. Um, and this is what it looks like right now. So um, this is the embedding sort of sparkle action menu that we have within the app. There's, we provide multiple ways for users to access the key date settings. And uh, when they click the action, we display the, the sort of PDF viewer with the contract and the dates that we have, and they can review those dates and see where we're sourcing them from the contract because we wanna give the power to the users to confirm that the AI is doing the right thing. And once they, uh, they can select the dates that they want, save those, and it ends up in the key dates tab. The really powerful thing that I really wanna talk about here is this is not where it stops. Once it gets on the screen, the app takes care of a lot of other things. For example, sending them automated reminders about these key dates, as well as the planner that you saw in the hub that Sam talked about. We 
provide all the key date obligations on that planner app as well. Not only that, that goes on and syncs to Outlook for our users so that they can see all of those obligations and other tools outside of LawView. So we've taken something that is super critical for our users, ensured we get it accurate almost always, make it run faster in the app, allow Easy Review to confirm those dates, and give users what they ask for, but beyond that as well with derived dates, and integrate it into other tools outside of LawView. So that means we're kind of deeply embedding the outcome of AI features into the wider workflow. And I think this is how it's really helping our users get the most out of the features that we build. I touched on evals earlier, like how do we know we've got it accurate? Um, you know, evals are a critical part of the building block of building reliable AI products and features. Often they start, often for us and a lot of other customers as well that we've spoken with, they start with manually creating ground truth data. We do this, uh, this is kind of our process at the moment. We do it for a specific use case. Uh, we start with say key date extraction. We decompose it or break it down into multiple scenarios like fixed dates, um, you know, effective dates or end dates or derived dates as another scenario like 30 days from end date. With each scenario we generate ground truth for that from representative sample contract documents and we have few law view staff take a look at those documents and really um, go through them manually to generate that ground truth. And each document is looked at by multiple people to make sure that there's no bias when generating that ground truth. Next, we run those same documents through our AI process. Um, we change a few things as we're trying to do that to you know, make sure we're getting the prompt right. We're adjusting the user permissions and trying different users when we're doing the evaluation to make sure the user access and permissions and governance are still working properly. We'll also change up the underlying data to make sure that all of that's working. So all of that up to kind of the evals box is manually done. It's hard work, but it's kind of how we really guarantee that our solutions are working. Once we get to that, we then uh, take that evaluation test, uh, evaluation and put it into our evaluation test suite. And we run them in an automated fashion. Every day, um, almost all of them run every day. This kind of gives us a benchmark of how we're performing uh, in terms of those evaluations and trend lines so we can look at them over time. And we monitor them closely. Our, we have integrated, uh, uh, automated sort of notifications when things aren't looking right. And recently we had, um, we had some pop through when we changed LLM models uh, and those, some specific scenarios started breaking. And because of these evals, we were able to kind of hone in on them quickly and find fixes um, for them. Another quick example around evaluations is um, uh, this chart here, which demonstrates how we experimented with 20 to 30 different chunking strategies to help us improve our, our applications. We knew that AI Assist and the chunking that we had, or even the first version of workspace intelligence, wasn't that great. Uh, and we knew from industry evidence that we needed to do something different with our chunking strategy. We needed to build some um, self-contained chunks, or what are known as semantically similar chunks, in order to generate great, um, great output from our AI. The key point to highlight here is that with our evaluation data and ground truth available, our engineers were able to run all of these experiments within a week to be able to land on a solution that was right fit for our, for our problem. Uh, and we saw almost 65% improvement in median retrieval scores from, uh, from baseline that we had. The qualitative, qualitative results were also really good. Um, we saw significant improvement in how we were generating outputs for summarization. So the, uh, so the workspace intelligence summarization that Sam showed, that was also made possible through chunking strategy improvements. So evals are really key, uh, but they're really hard. But they're also, you, know, you can't build an AI solution without evals. Final point here is, um, our final key lessons is, you know, building great products starts with understanding the fundamentals. What do your customers truly need? While AI is transformative, 
cloud and mobile, like the cloud and mobile in the earlier days, but focusing on technology um, is not going to build, help you build great products. To create real value, we must deeply understand what our users want. What are their challenges? What's repetitive for them? What's frustrating for them? What do they can't do right now that's really important for them and where AI can augment that? So AI doesn't have to be also groundbreaking. Uh, small, delightful features that integrate seamlessly into workflows for the users can have a big impact, as you saw with the key dates and how we integrate directly into Outlook. And that's kind of where it's valuable for our users. What does it also mean for us? Um, when, as Sam mentioned, when ChatGPT became mainstream, uh, chat interfaces were everywhere, and that's where we started as well. And as you saw with AI Assist, we were driven by competitive threats, other stakeholders internally that were asking us, what are we doing with AI? Even our customers, they were asking, what's your AI roadmap? However, we quickly realized like our customers and what they got out of AI features really depended on where they were on the AI adoption curve, how much they were using ChatGPT and other tools. The more that they were using those tools, the more value they got out of our tool because it kind of required really good prompt engineering and a bit of experimentation mindset. And others that weren't um, using those tools saw kind of limited results. So we realized not all our users are going to be prompt engineers. They don't have time to become one either. They're quite busy in their day-to-day -day lives. And for our customers, we saw contract summarization work uh, really um, be different based on their AI adoption. So to solve this, um, we hid all of that complexity behind the Sparkle action menu and key actions that we provided so that our customers didn't really have to think about how do I write a great prompt to give me a summarization that's comprehensive and consistent and detailed enough all the time? Uh, how do I find where AI is? Uh, so the Sparkle menu is embedded within the apps in the right place uh, in, into the sort of screens and UI that they're used to. So this allowed users to access the powerful AI features effortlessly without needing to master prompts and make their everyday task easy with just a click of a button. Um, we've, here's another example of how we're embedding. So we've already seen this key action, uh, key dates extraction. A big part of the approach is leveraging interfaces that users are already familiar with, making adoption smoother and more intuitive. This modal that we've got here is a document viewer with a panel on the side. We use the same modal in lots of other screens. So it's not something new that the users have to learn. The UI is the critical last mile, and that's a learning that we've had uh, where with that UI, you know, your, um, your products and features truly come life for users. Relying solely on chat interfaces can really limit the range of program, uh, problems that we solve for our users. So by focusing on familiar and user-friendly user interfaces, we ensure that our solutions are accessible, efficient, and impactful for our users. Here's another, I've got a couple more examples that I want to show you. So uh, here's an example of how we're leveraging LLMs for invoice uh, analysis. When an invoice is uploaded, the system automatically reviews it against guidelines that have been set by the internal team, and it automatically highlights the exceptions and discrepancies that it's found versus those guidelines. And within minutes, or maybe at a later time, depending on whatever the workflow the user has, they can come back and take a look, um, about, uh, take a look at those discrepancies. Again, from a UI perspective, instead of using a chat interface, we're displaying results in a panel that the customers are already used to seeing um, for, for this user interface. And the insights and the guidelines and the discrepancies are um, easily visible as well. So we're tapping into UI patterns that the users know. Again, not chat. Finally, this may be the wrong conference to say this, but not everything needs AI, as Sam alluded to earlier. Uh, you know, we've scraped a lot of ideas that we thought were perfect for, for LLMs. For example, an idea that we had was, you know, why don't we take an LLM and we generate short titles for tasks and legal matters 
uh, based on the key attributes that are filled in for that task. While it seemed good enough at first glance when we did some proof of concepts, testing with legal people and legal experts and customers showed it really had a major flaw. Customers needed 100% deterministic naming conventions for, their for these tasks, for their workflow, because they would rely on these names and the consistent format, because they would look at hundreds of rows of data and various screen and law view, and not having perfectly aligned deterministic naming conventions would mean that it would actually be frustrating if, they, if we ended up using LLMs to generate those names. So, and that was a problem at that time. I know LLMs have come a long way, but at that point, we ended up shelving that idea. So key takeaway is focus on core jobs to be done. Deeply understand the user workflows. And remember, that not every problem needs an AI solution. And most importantly, never ask customers, and I'm guilty of this, what AI features do you need? Um, last demo video for the day, promise. Um, here's a video of an AI feature. Again, we've got the Sparkle Action menu embedded in here. Again, not a chat. This is a feature that's launching, launching soon for our users. What it does here is that you know, legal teams often handle hundreds of incoming tasks that are coming through from business, business users. This new feature suggests top three people that are best suited for each incoming task. Early test shows that our customers love this idea and love what it can do for them. The secret here is that we're not even using an LLM. Instead, the system analyzes historical data of how previous tasks have been assigned and learns pattern based on that, as well as other parameters and input about what current workflows look like and what's, who's available to generate accurate suggestions, all within milliseconds. We may actually be using SQL. I can't confirm or deny. Users don't care. So finally, users don't care if, uh, if we're using LLMs, AI, machine learning, or SQL queries. As long as it works seamlessly and fits into their workflow, this is how we deliver practical and useful solutions every day at LawView. Final slide. There we go. So in summary, the three things that we uh, mentioned right at the beginning, uh, keep an eye on the evolving Azure services that are uh, that are always you know, becoming available and evolve your platform as you need based on your customer demands and expectations. Data is still the secret source. You can't throw your data at AI and just hope magic happens. We've got to pay close attention and it's your core cornered resource that you have that nobody else has. Plus evals are really critical for shipping faster and confidently. And finally, dig deep into customer jobs to be done and where AI can augment their workflows to help them do more, do it faster, and do it to a higher quality. Thank you. I think we have a couple of minutes if there are questions.